His path to fame was long and thorny. However, after writing a song about space, he immediately received the blessing of the universe. He invented crazy stage images, and one of them almost devoured him. He dreamed of becoming Mick Jagger and became David Bowie. You are on the Biographer channel, and today we will tell you about the life of a talented performer with a difficult character, a visionary, and an innovator. The legendary David Bowie. Get comfortable, and we're starting. David Robert Jones, that's how David Bowie was named at birth, was born on January 8, 1947, in Brixton in South London. His mom, Margaret Mary Peggy, was originally from Sheraton, Kent. Her paternal relatives immigrated from Ireland and settled in Manchester. Peggy worked as a waitress at the Royal Tunbridge Wells Cinema. Perhaps it was because of this that young David would be attracted to art and cinema. The boy's father, Haywood Stinton John Jones, was originally from Doncaster, Yorkshire, and worked as a promotion officer for the children's charity Barnardo's. The family lived at 40 Stansfield Road on the border between Brixton and Stockwell in the South London borough of Lambeth. Bowie attended Stockwell Infant School up to the age of six and gained a reputation of a gifted and purposeful child, but he was also a daring brawler. During David's childhood, the family moved a lot. For two years, they managed to live in Bickley and then in Bromley Common, until, in 1955, they finally settled in Sundridge Park. There, Bowie attended Burnt Ash Junior School, and it was then that the child's innate talents were revealed for the first time. The school choir considered David's voice to be adequate, and he demonstrated above-average abilities in playing the recorder. When he was nine, he showed quite good dance moves in the newly opened music and dance class. Teachers called his interpretations vividly artistic and his balance amazing for a child. In addition, that year, David's interest in music only intensified when his father brought home a collection of records, American 45s. So the boy first got acquainted with the work of the teenagers, the platters, Fats Domino, Elvis Presley, as well as Little Richard, who would later play a role in Bowie's life. Listening to Little Richard's song Tutti Frutti, Bowie would later say that he had heard God. I don't know what to do to me, Tutti Frutti. Oh, Rudy. David was first struck by Presley when he saw his cousin Christina dancing to Hound Dog, shortly after its release in 1956. According to Christina, she and David often danced like possessed elves to recordings by different artists. By the end of the following year, Bowie had taken up ukulele and tea chest bass and started taking part in skiffle sessions with friends. And besides that, he started playing the piano. His numerous reproductions of Presley and Chuck Berry's stage performances, made by his local Wolf Cub group, complete with tributes to artists, was described as mesmerizing, like someone from another planet. The father encouraged his son to follow his dream of becoming an artist from infancy in the late 1950s. He took David to meet singers and other performers, preparing for the Royal Variety performance, and introduced him to Alma Cogan and Tommy Steele. After passing his 11-plus exam after graduating from Burnt Ash Junior School, David Bowie entered Bromley Technical High School. It was an unusual technical school. Despite its status, by the time David enrolled in 1958, it was as rich in secret rituals as any English public school. In addition to the sciences, special emphasis was made on design. The school had a unified and well-thought-out system of rewards and punishments, and a collegial atmosphere flourished under the leadership of Owen Frampton, according to biographer Christopher Sanford. In David's account, Frampton led through force of personality, not intellect. His colleagues at Bromley Tech were famous for neither and yielded the school's most gifted pupils to the arts, a regime so liberal that Frampton actively encouraged his own son Peter to pursue a musical career with David, a partnership briefly intact 30 years later. Bowie studied art, music, and design, including layout and typing. During these years, David was greatly influenced by his maternal half-brother, Terry Burns. He was 10 years older than David, suffered from schizophrenia and seizures, and lived at home and periodically in psychiatric wards. However, during the time they spent together at home, he introduced the young Bowie to many things that influenced him. Modern jazz, Buddhism, beat poetry, and the occult. To tell the truth, not only Terry Burns had psychological problems in the Bowie family, its significant part had schizophrenia spectrum disorders, including two aunts. One of them was placed in a medical institution, and another had a lobotomy. Over time, it was noted that this influenced Bowie's early work. Burns introduced him to modern jazz, and this new hobby led to David's mother giving him a Grafton saxophone in 1961. He soon began taking lessons from baritone saxophonist Ronnie Ross. During his studies, David became more and more sociable. It was especially noticeable in the annual school reports. First year, reliable and capable. 
Second year, a good steady worker who should do well. Fourth year, a pleasant, friendly idler but perhaps capable of better work with maturity. Fifth year, a complete exhibitionist. Well, the character of the brawler and the boy didn't go anywhere. So one day, David got into a fight at school over a girl and got seriously injured. His friend George Underwood hit him in the left eye. As a result, George's nail got right into David's eye. This was followed by a four-month hospitalization and a series of serious surgeries. Doctors determined that it would not be possible to completely eliminate the damage in the problem, and Bowie was left with faulty depth of perception and anisocoria. His pupil was constantly dilated. Often, this feature created a false impression of a change in color of the iris of the eye, mistakenly indicating heterochromia iridum, when one iris differs in color from another. Nevertheless, David didn't have different eye colors. They were both blue. Within a few years, this eye became one of the most recognizable features of David Bowie. Despite the quarrel with Underwood, the friends remained on good terms, and George would create covers for Bowie's early albums. After all, just in 1962, at the age of 15, David formed his first musical group, Conrad's. Playing guitar, rock and roll at local youth gatherings and weddings, the Conrads had a diverse lineup that ranged from four to eight people, including Underwood. The very next year, Bowie left college and informed his parents about his serious intention to become a pop star. Obviously fearing his son's failures, David's mother arranged for him to be employed as an electrician's assistant. The guy himself was disappointed with the limited aspirations of his bandmates and soon left Conrad's. Bowie joined another band, the King Bees, but the band needed a manager. Then David decided to pull off what the Beatles had managed to do. He wrote to the recently succeeded washing machine entrepreneur, John Bloom, do for us what Brian Epstein has done for the Beatles and make another million. He invited Bloom to manage the group, but he did not respond to the offer. But the appeal to Dick James's partner, Leslie Kahn, led to the signing of the first personal management contract with Bowie. Kahn immediately set about promoting Bowie. David recorded his debut single, Liza Jane, which was released by Davy Jones and the band in 1964. Yes, you heard right. Davy Jones was the first stage name the performer took for himself. However, the single did not find commercial success. Dissatisfied with the King Bees and the band's repertoire, which consisted of Howlin' Wolf and Willie Dixon covers, Bowie left the band less than a month later. After that, he immediately joined the Manish Boys. It was another blues band that played in the genres of folk and soul. Bowie later recalled, I used to dream of being their Mick Jagger. Their cover of Bobby Bland's I Pity the Fool was not much more successful than Liza Jane, and soon Bowie moved back to a new band, Lower Third a blues trio strongly inspired by The Who. The song You've Got a Habit of Leaving fared no better than the previous songs, signaling the end of Khan's contract. Bowie stated that he would leave the world of pop music to study mime at Sadler's Wells, and nevertheless remained in lower third. His new manager, Ralph Horton, who later facilitated his transition to his solo career, helped him sign a contract with Pie Records. Publicist Tony Hatch signed David on the basis that he wrote his own songs. Gradually, the young and fashionable David gained experience as a performer. However, with the appearance of the Monkees in the mid-60s, there was a confusion of two Davy Jones. David began to be confused with Davy Jones from the Monkees, and the artist was forced to change his name for the last time. True story, I was Tom Jones for about a couple of weeks, and just as I was doing the photo session, he released his first record. That's how David Bowie appeared. The pseudonym was taken in honor of the American pioneer of the 19th century James Bowie and the Bowie Knife, which he popularized. The first release under the new pseudonym was the January 1966 single, Can't Help Thinking About Me, recorded with Lower Third. He failed, like his predecessors, and Bowie left the band. Cabaret Pantomime, Bandstand, Brass Band With all this unfashionable stuff in the mid-1960s, David, who had just invented the pseudonym Bowie, was trying to break into the pop charts, where youth rock was running. The guy tried in every way to bend the rules of the game, but nothing came out. He released a couple more singles for Pie Records, Do Anything You Say, and I Dig Everything, recorded with a new band called The Buzz, and moved to Duram Records. Around the same time, David was also a member of the band Riot Squad. Their recordings, including one of Bowie's original compositions recorded with the Velvet Underground, remained unreleased. On June 1, 1967, David Bowie's self-titled debut album was released. The record was a mix of pop music, psychedelia, and music hall. And what do you think? Yes, the album suffered the same fate as the previous compositions. 
This was the last release for the next couple of years. In September, David recorded two new singles, but the label refused them. In fairness, it should be said that these two singles, Let Me Sleep Beside You and Karma Man, were still released in 1970 and marked the beginning of Bowie's working relationship with producer Tony Visconti. His singing career had to be postponed, as delusionment with the industry forced Bowie to pursue a pantomime career, studying under Lindsay Kemp. This passing was the decisive final stage in the creation of the legendary Bowie. Studying dramatic art, from avant-garde theater and pantomime to commedia dell'arte, Bowie immersed himself in creating characters to surprise the world with them. That's how Over the Wall We Go, a satirical mockery of life in a British prison, and Silly Boy Blue, which tells about the escape of a teenager, were written. In parallel, Bowie became a member of a new musical trio. Hermione Farthingale formed a band with David and guitarist John Hutchinson called Feathers. In the following months, they gave several concerts combining folk, Mersey beat, poetry, and Bowie's favorite, pantomime. David literally fell in love with Hermione Farthingale, who was a wonderful dancer and actress. The father of the 19-year-old girl was a wealthy lawyer and completely disapproved of her decision to leave home and live with David two years later. Bowie would dedicate the lines of Life on Mars to Hermione, who runs out of the house after a quarrel with her parents and remains misunderstood. But her mother is yelling no, and her father has asked her to go. Fortunately for her father, and unfortunately for Bowie, Hermione got a role in the musical Song of Norway and went to Scandinavia to shoot. She was not ready to share a guy with anyone else, so she left him, taking up her own acting career. Hermione was his first serious love, but according to David, she broke his heart. Ironically, over the next few months, Bowie will use his longing in songs and they will bring him fame, and the girl will get a few more roles on stage, on the screen, and will disappear into obscurity without a trace. So at the beginning of 1969, Feathers broke up, but the artist did not grieve for a long time and moved to live with Mary Finnegan. Mary was living in a block of flats in Beckingham, South London, and heard Bowie playing his 12-string Gibson guitar from an upstairs window. She invited him to her house for a cup of tea and fell in love with his charms. Bowie, who was 22 at the time, became her lodger and lover for the next six months. The girl even helped him a little with his career by arranging an open mic evening at the Three Tons Pub in Beckingham. David continued experimenting with the genres of rock and roll and blues, starting with Farthingale. He joined forces with Finnegan, Christina Ostrom, and Barry Jackson to run a folk club at Three Tons Pub on Sunday evenings. The club was influenced by the Arts Lab movement, which developed into the Beckenham Arts Lab and became extremely popular. This period truly becomes a turning point in David's career, as soon as he will meet his first great success. On July 16, 1969, the BBC began reporting on the moon landing. The audience watched as this amazing feat of humanity unfolded in front of them. The nation was obsessed with space. They tuned in to watch one of the most iconic moments of all time shown on TV. And five days before that, David released his new single called Space Oddity. The single was included in this momentous report, and when Apollo 11 safely returned home, the song also gained fame and success, taking fifth place in the charts. By the way, the first Bowie personality appears in Space Oddity, Major Tom. Thanks to the study of the avant-garde, David began to create images that people would respond to. In November, David's second album was released, retitled David Bowie. It seems that the artist's manager didn't think much about the name of the record, and on the other hand, really, the artist's name is the best name to pay attention to, don't you think? Anyway, the release caused some confusion with its predecessor with the same name, in 1972, the album was reissued internationally by RCA Records as Space Oddity. The album was permeated with philosophical post-hippie lyrics about peace, love, and morality. It's acoustic folk rock, sometimes amplified by hard rock. But at the time of the release, the album was not a commercial success and gained fame only over the years. In April 1969, when Bowie was staying with Mary Finnegan, he met actress and journalist Angela Barnett. According to the girl, they met thanks to a mutual friend the head of the Calvin Mark Lee record label. And less than a year later, on March 19, 1970, the couple married at Bromley Register Office in Beckenham Lane, Kent. They arranged an open marriage, and as Angela said, it was a marriage of convenience. We got married so that I could work to get a permit. I didn't think it would last, and David said, before we got married, I'm not really in love with you. And I thought that's probably a good thing. 
The wife's influence on David was immediate. At least, that's what she thought. In fact, one of the reasons to marry David was Angela's desire to make him a star. According to her, she inspired Bowie for future metamorphoses. After the wedding, David was cute, intimate, and nice, and wanted a baby. Because of this, his manager Kenneth Pitt was disappointed that he now had less influence on the artist. A year later, on May 30, 1971, the young couple had their first child, Duncan Zoe Haywood Jones. With the release of Space Oddity, Bowie established himself as a solo artist, but he felt one drawback. David lacked a permanent group for performances and recordings, people with whom he would communicate personally. The band Bowie assembled included John Cambridge, a drummer Bowie met at the Arts Lab, Tony Visconti on bass, and Mick Ronson on electric guitar, and took the name The David Bowie Band. Before the first performance, renaming the group and calling it Hype, the guys created characters for themselves and wore elaborate costumes that became the prototype of the glam style of another group of Davids, Spiders from Mars. However, a disastrous performance at the London Roundhouse prompted the guys to return to the model where David Bowie presented himself as a solo artist. Working in the studio was accompanied by heated disagreements between Bowie and Cambridge over the style of drumming. The situation reached a climax when an enraged Bowie accused the drummer of rioting, exclaiming, You're f my album! Cambridge left the band and was replaced by Mick Woods Menzi. The brawler Bowie fired the manager and replaced him with Tony DeFries. As a result, Bowie later would have to pay Kenneth Pitt compensation after many years of litigation. Over the past 10 years, by the age of 25, Bowie had replaced a dozen musical groups and unwanted colleagues. He had been looking for himself for a long time and working out his image, and finally became a prominent figure in the world of music. But all the most interesting things in his career were just beginning. During the studio sessions in 1970, David Bowie's third album, The Man Who Sold the World, was recorded. The album moved away from the acoustic and folk rock sound of the former Bowie towards hard rock with elements of blues rock. The lyrics also became more somber. They explored the themes of insanity, religion, technology, and war, referring to schizophrenia, paranoia, and delirium, which David was familiar with thanks to his half-brother. As a promo album, the musician again took advantage of his theatricality and appeared before the public in the image of an androgynous, a long-haired, slender person wearing a dress. The same image was featured on the original cover of the British version of the album. Bowie took this dress with him and wore it during the interview. Critics have claimed that you are more oh, f critics. <laughs> <laughs> critics approved of this image. John Mendelssohn of Rolling Stone described it as ravishing, almost distractingly reminiscent of Lauren Bacall. And on the street, Bowie was often met with mixed reactions, including laughter. There was even a case when a passerby pulled out a gun and told Bowie, kiss my ass. What do you think about this? Was it an independent statement about the artist's perception of the world or the pursuit of hype and fame? Write your opinion in the comments. We read all of them and often join the discussion. With the release of the album, David went on his first American tour. There, he had the opportunity to observe two outstanding proto-punk artists, which led him to develop a concept that would eventually result in a full-fledged new character, a melding of the persona of Iggy Pop with the music of Lou Reed, producing the ultimate pop idol. An acquaintance of Bowie recalls his scrawling notes on a cocktail napkin about a crazy rock star named Iggy or Ziggy. Immediately upon returning to England, he declared his intention to create the character who looks like he's landed from Mars. In the winter of 1971, Bowie's fourth album, Hunky Dory, was released, and it was he who really attracted the attention of the public. On this seminal album, Bowie perfected his songwriting abilities. However, David became successful only when he finally formed his brightest stage image of a Martian rock star, Ziggy Stardust. Ziggy Stardust's exuberant fashion made the character and Bowie himself the main icons in the glam rock genre until the 1970s, defining what this genre would become. The success of the character and his iconic image made Bowie an international superstar. Bowie's Ziggy Stardust was the alter ego that changed music forever and sent his career into orbit. Bowie explained that the character was conceived as an alien rock star who arrived on Earth. The planet was dying due to a lack of natural resources. All over the world, elderly people lost touch with reality, and children began to lead a hedonistic lifestyle and no longer want rock music because there was no electricity to play it. 
In Ziggy's dream, Infinity advised him to write about the arrival of a Starman who will save the Earth. Ziggy's story about the Starman is the first message of hope that people hear, so they immediately cling to it. Ziggy soon gathers a large number of followers, and he is worshipped as a prophet. Eventually, Infinity comes along and tears Ziggy apart on stage. His hair was dyed Schwarzkopf red. The dye contained 30 volumes of peroxide, which gave Bowie's hair some volume. But later he would use a dandruff remedy called Guard to make them stiff and vertical. Over time, the hairstyle gained wide popularity and became mainstream in the fashion world. The Ziggy cut became into hairdressing in the early 70s, what the Lady D cut was for the early 80s. Only with double the appeal, because it worked for both sexes. You have the coolest hair in rock and roll. Thank you I, very I have much. to say that right now. In addition to the hairstyle for David and his band, special costumes were also sewn by his friend, the tailor, Freddie Beretti. These costumes were based on those worn by Droogs in Stanley Kubrick's film A Clockwork Orange, Bowie explained. I wanted to take the hardness and violence of those Clockwork Orange outfits, the trousers tucked into big boots and the codpiece things, and soften them up by using the most ridiculous fabrics. It was a Dada thing, this extreme ultraviolet and Liberty fabrics. A total of seven different costumes were sewn by Kansai Yamamoto for all Ziggy Stardust shows. Thanks to Ziggy, Bowie no longer created one-off characters for songs or album covers. Ziggy was a total immersion. In one interview, he said, Off stage, I'm a robot. On stage, I achieve emotion. It's probably why I prefer dressing up as Ziggy to being David. And which stage image of Bowie do you like the most? Let us know in the comments. On February 10th, 1972, Bowie dressed in a spectacular suit with bright red mullet painted, presented his stage show Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Ronson, Boulder, and Woodmansey at the Toby Chug Pub in Tolworth and Kingston upon Thames. The show was extremely popular, literally catapulting David to fame. Over the next six months, he toured the UK and created a Bowie cult that was unique. Its influence lasted longer and has been more creative than almost any other force within pop fandom. Almost immediately after the release of the previous film, a record was created that instantly became a classic. The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. A record without which any list of the greatest albums of all time would simply be incomplete. 1972 was the year Bowie became an international superstar. On July 6th, Ziggy materialized for the first time on the screen of millions of unsuspecting viewers in a landmark performance of Top of the Pops, performing Starman, the album's lead single. Didn't know what time it was and the lights were low. After seeing the show, GQ UK editor Dylan Jones said, This is the performance that turned Bowie into a star, embedding his Ziggy Stardust persona into the nation's consciousness. It was one of the most impressive and innovative live performances to date, expanding the parameters of a live rock show and single handedly launching a worldwide explosion of glam. But the performances that followed next were no less discussed. The performances were shocking for that time, and anything could happen. Once, he stripped down to nothing but a sumo loin, and he could frequently simulate oral sex with Mick Ronson's guitar. The hairless brow ridges became the final touch in the image of Ziggy Stardust. Brows fell victim to David's alcohol-aggravated nervous breakdown. The band Mott the Hoople, to which Bowie wrote the main hit All the Young Dudes, rejected his next gift. The song Drive-In Saturday. After more than 40 years, it is clear that this androgynous appearance has shaped the present to a much greater extent than the Beatles' potty haircuts and Zeppelin patches. Bowie made experiments, not only in music, and on stage. So, despite the fact that David slept with girls and was married to Angela Barnett, in an interview with Melody Maker, he stated that he was gay. However, sometime later in a conversation with Playboy, he clarified that he was still bisexual. Whatever it was, it became clear to society that David Bowie was breaking a taboo and was not afraid to use it to his advantage. It's enough to listen to his interview. Seconds of meeting somebody and I can adopt their accent. I've always found that I collect. I'm a collector. By the spring of 1973, Ziggy had traveled all over the world. Hordes of children from London to Japan were cutting their hair to look like stardust and dancing to Suffragette City in their new platform's shoes. The real Ziggy mania started. David did not stop working and continued to release new music. In 1974, Bowie moved to the United States, first staying in New York and then settling in Los Angeles. In May, the next phase of Bowie's completely original work began in the form of his eighth album, the dystopian epic Diamond Dogs, 
The album was the product of two different ideas, a musical based on a wild future in a post-apocalyptic city, and a production of George Orwell's 1984 in the form of music. The album reached number one in the UK and number five in the States. The subsequent promotional tour of America included a magnificent choreography by Tony Basil, a high-budget production with theatrical special effects, which was shot by Alan Yintop. The resulting documentary, Cracked Actor, unexpectedly showed Bowie pale and emaciated. This complete immersion of the performer in the image could damage his personal life. David could no longer distinguish between his real self because he was playing the same role over and over again. During this period of time, he began to have serious drug problems. Ziggy wouldn't leave me alone for years. That was when it all started to go sour. My whole personality was affected. It became very dangerous. I really did have doubts about my sanity. The tour coincided with his transition from heavy cocaine use to addiction, which led to severe physical exhaustion, paranoia, and emotional problems. It became clear that Ziggy was going to die, but Bowie had a couple more years before that moment. So in 1975, David's new album, Young Americans, was released, which departed from the glam rock style, reflecting Bowie's interest in soul and R&B. Over the years, most British rockers have tried to become black by extension in one way or another. Few have succeeded, unlike Bowie. He called this style plastic soul. One of the interesting tracks on the album was the song Fame, co-written with John Lennon. By the way, if you're interested in the biography of the legend of British rock, click on the link in the upper right corner. There you will find out what John Lennon was like and why he passed away so early. Bowie, having earned the title of almost the first white artist to appear on the US variety show Soul Train, mimed fame as well as Golden Years, a single that was first offered by Elvis Presley, but he refused. Shortly after that, David went to Los Angeles to star in the cult sci-fi drama by Nicholas Roeg, The Man Who Fell to Earth. I'd like to hear people sing. Let's have singing. Find some singing. The film is based on the novel of the same name by Walter Tevis and tells about an alien, Thomas Drum Newton, who makes an emergency landing on Earth in search of a way to deliver water to his planet, which is suffering from severe drought. But the hero finds himself at the mercy of human vices and corruption. Thanks to surreal images and Bowie's first starring role in a movie as Thomas Drum Newton, the film gained cult status. However, David himself didn't remember at all the process of shooting. Bowie, who used cocaine while working on the film, was in an unstable state and went so far as to say in a 1983 interview, I'm so pleased I made that film, but I didn't really know what was being made at all. And my one snapshot memory of that film is not having to act. Just being me was perfectly adequate for the role. I wasn't of this earth at that particular time. He just threw his true self into the film, knowing almost nothing about the established procedure for making films and guided only by instinct. I just learned the lines for that day and did them the way I was feeling. It wasn't that far off. I actually was feeling as alienated as that character was. It was a pretty natural performance. A good exhibition of somebody literally falling apart in front of you. I was totally insecure with about 10 grams of cocaine a day in me. I was stoned out of my mind from beginning to end. Soon, events began that would eventually lead to the final disappearance of Ziggy Stardust, repeating Pitt's abrupt dismissal, which happened five years earlier. But we fired his manager. This was followed by a months-long legal dispute, the rejection of millions of dollars of his future earnings on exceptionally generous terms for the manager. And then, according to Close People, he shut himself up in West 20th Street where for a week his howls could be heard through the locked attic door. By his own later confirmation, his mind reeled with cocaine. He overdosed several times during the year, and he physically withered to an alarming degree. David urgently needed to change something. The extent to which addiction affected Bowie became known when Russell Hardy interviewed him for the weekend television talk show ahead of the upcoming tour. In this lengthy conversation, Bowie looked disconnected and spoke incoherently. Your missus, your Angie, was, has been a guest on my show. She was lovely. I saw it. I, I had a, a, a coffee sent over to me. In 1976, Bowie radically changed not only musically but also physically. In addition to music, Bowie was also an artist. He moved to Switzerland, buying a chalet in the hills north of Lake Geneva. In the new environment, his cocaine addiction decreased, and he found time for other pursuits besides a musical career. 
he devoted more time to painting and created a number of postmodern works. Sometimes during the tour, he would sketch in a notebook and photograph scenes for future reference. While at Claude de Mossange, the artist began an intensive self-improvement course in classical music and literature and began working on an autobiography. I wanted to be some kind of artist. Um, I wanted to prove myself in some field as an artist. With the release of David's 10th studio album, Station to Station, the last character of the artist appeared, the Thin White Duke. Presented by the opening line of the album, The Return of the Thin White Duke, throwing darts in lovers' eyes, the character was a continuation of Thomas Jerome Newton, another Bowie character he played in The Man Who Fell to Earth. Footage from the film made up the cover of Station to Station. The record was some kind of a dark turn for Bowie. The contrast between his harsh, Krautrock-inspired melodies and over-the-top vocals jar bordered on uncomfortable territory. The album was perfectly made and provided an excellent listening experience. The only annoying thing was that the artist himself didn't remember how he recorded it because of the staggering dose of cocaine he was using at the time. In fact, during this period, Bowie's diet consisted exclusively of red pepper, milk, and cocaine. This diet was undoubtedly the reason for Bowie's stern appearance, immaculately dressed but drained and pale, a person who suffered so much and talked about love but at the same time felt absolutely nothing. After the release of the album, David went on a North American and European tour. He was extremely successful, but surprisingly mired in political disputes. For example, David's quote, Britain could benefit from a fascist leader, was blown away, and the artist was even detained by customs officers at the Russian-Polish border for possession of Nazi paraphernalia. The situation reached a climax in May in London, becoming known as the Victoria Station Incident. Arriving in an open-top Mercedes convertible, Bowie waved to a crowd of fans and was captured on camera at the moment when his hand stopped in the middle of a swing, like a Nazi salute. This photo was published in NME. Later, David blamed Thin White Duke for his pro-fascist comments and similar behavior during this time period. I was out of my mind, totally crazed. The main thing I was functioning on was mythology. That whole thing about Hitler and rightism, I discovered King Arthur. He had a very bad experience of using heavy drugs. Bowie's cocaine addiction, which sparked these controversies, was largely due to the fact that he lived in Los Angeles, a city that alienated him. In an interview with NME in 1980, Bowie said that Los Angeles was where it had all happened. The fucking place should be wiped off the face of the earth. To be anything to do with rock and roll and go and live in Los Angeles is, I think, just heading for disaster. After a couple of years, David was finally cured of addiction. He apologized for his statements and throughout the 1980s and 1990s would criticize racism in European politics and the American music industry. So by the end of 1976, Bowie's interest in the burgeoning German music scene, as well as his drug addiction, prompted him to move to West Berlin to get sober and revitalize his career. There, he was often seen riding a bicycle from his home on Hopstroff in Schoenberg to the Hansa Tun Studio recording studio on Kolfenerstroff in Kreuzberg, located near the Berlin Wall. So, Thin White Duke was left behind. Moving to Germany had a positive effect on the artist. Soon he released three incredibly beautiful albums, Low, Heroes, and Lodger, known as the Berlin Trilogy, each of which he remembered. Low and Heroes were saturated with ambient sound and demonstrated the spirit of the Cold War, the symbol of which was Berlin divided in two by a wall. The sound included ambient sounds from various sources, white noise generators, synthesizers, etc. The albums became hits. Heroes took third place in the UK chart, but the third part of the triptych showed an even better result. Lodger, of 1979, abandoned the minimalist ambient rock nature of the two predecessors, partially returning to drum and guitar rock and pop music of the pre-Berlin Bowie era. In 1980, David's 14th studio album, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, was released, which included the single Ashes to Ashes. In it, David Bowie returned to his first identity, Major Tom. The single immediately took first place in the UK charts. The composition was especially unique. Not only did it have one of the most innovative clips at that time, but the song itself was a full-fledged performance. It was similar to Bowie's Purification. Three voices of the performer sound in at once. David Bowie, the narrator, do you remember a guy that's been in slash in such an early song? Major Tom, confessing his demons, 
Time and again, I tell myself, slash, I'll stay clean tonight, and a group of persecutors giving Major Tom his last rites. Ashes to ashes, funk to funky, slash, we know Major Tom's a junkie. It was a clear message to the fans that Major Tom was buried. Having overcome his previous problems, the chameleon of music shed his skin, left art rock behind, and was going to take the mainstream. The truth came to the ridiculous. Society was already expecting new images from the artist and was looking for them in everything. This is, this is really you. This is not you just still sort of playing the role of Paul in the film. After eight years of marriage, the relationship between Angie and David Bowie deteriorated. Eventually reaching the limit, the couple separated, filing for divorce on February 8, 1980 in Switzerland. Their relationship was strange. Angie admitted that she knew about and supported David's affair with Loretta Watson, which lasted less than a year. In the divorce process, the girl received 500,000 pounds, paid in installments, and a 10-year gagging clause. Not wanting to fight for custody, she left their son with David. Angie stated that David's addiction to drugs was so out of control that putting him in charge of raising their son stabilized him. During the marriage, she often accompanied her husband on his international concert tours, and Bowie's song, The Prettiest Star, was dedicated to his wife. However, after the divorce, she said that she was blackballed from the entertainment industry and was so depressed that she considered suicide. Fortunately, it did not come to that, and Angie found herself in a new business. Throughout the 80s, Bowie reached a new level of commercial success. He released hit after hit, Ashes to Ashes, Modern Love, and with the release of Let's Dance and Under Pressure recorded together with Queen, he even took the top of the charts. This was followed by a collaboration with Tina Turner and, once again, Iggy Pop. In a word, David was born again. Besides, in addition to successful work in music, he continued his acting career. So in the world of cinema, Bowie's new project was Just a Gigolo. Viewers and critics did not particularly appreciate the picture about the First World War. David stated that he took on the role as a favor to Hemings, who at the time was also planning to make a documentary about Bowie's 1978 concert tour. Of course, Bowie did not justify himself with this and jokingly described the film as, It was all my 32 Elvis Presley movies rolled into one. In 1982, the actor played the main role in the erotic horror film The Hunger, directed by Tony Scott. The picture became a cult in the gothic subculture. Bowie was happy to work on the film, but he was worried about the end result. I must say, there's nothing that looks like it on the market, but I'm a bit worried that it's just perversely bloody at some points," he said. The film received mixed reviews from critics, but got two nominations at the Saturn Awards for Best Costume and Best Makeup. After that, David Bowie appeared in a John Merrick performance, The Elephant Man. There, director Nagisa Oshima noticed him and chose him for the role of Madge Jack Strafer Selliers in the acclaimed World War II drama Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. The director felt that Bowie had an inner spirit that is indestructible. David was surprised that Oshima had an entire three-acre site on the Polynesian island of Rarotonga, but he shot it only in parts, and some places never got into the frame. Oshima only shot little bits at the corners. I kind of thought it was a waste. But when I saw the movie, it was just so powerful. You could feel the camp there, quite definitely. He later played a key role in the television adaptation of Bertolt Brecht's play Ball in 1983. Bowie reached the peak of his fame and went on a worldwide tour, the Serious Moonlight Tour. Half a year later, David returned from the tour incredibly popular and received two awards at the 1984 MTV Video Music Awards, including the inaugural Video Vanguard Award. In the same year, one of Bowie's new singles inspired him to create a short film, Jazzin' for Blue Jean, as in an extended version of the music video. David played two roles, the main character Vic and Screaming Lord Byron. It helped the performer to get a Grammy Award for Best Short Form Music Video. The artist continued to appear wherever he could and already in 1985 performed at Wembley Stadium for Live Aid, a charity concert with several venues to help the hungry in Ethiopia. David's next film was Absolute Beginners, a British musical adapted from the book by Colin McInnes about life in London in the late 50s. The picture was poorly received by critics, but Bowie's theme song of the same name rose to second place in the UK charts. We meet at last, Colin. Harris has been telling me all about you. Fantabulous! Meanwhile, David appeared as Jareth, the Goblin King, in the 1986 Jim Henson film Labyrinth. For two years, the script of the film went through 25 versions and edits. 
So one of the revised scripts was sent to Bowie, who found that there was not enough humor in it, and as a result, decided to refuse to participate in the project. To ensure Bowie's participation, director Jim Henson asked the screenwriter to refine the script to make it more fun. These improvements humanized the characters and pleased Henson to such an extent that they were included in the final script. The greatest difficulties in the early stages of filming were caused by the interaction of the stars with the puppets with whom they were filmed in most of their scenes. In an interview, Bowie recalled, I had some initial problems working with Hoggle and the rest because, for one thing, what they say doesn't come from their mouths, but from the side of the set or from behind you. Over time, the actors got used to it, and these moments no longer caused difficulties. David recorded five songs for the picture, but despite the efforts and a budget of $25 million, the film still failed at the box office. Box office receipts amounted to slightly more than half of the starting budget. Critics' reviews about the film were mixed, but all of them leaned in a positive direction. By that time, Bowie was already working hard on his new solo album, Never Let Me Down, in 1987, where he abandoned the light sound of his previous albums instead offering hard rock with an industrial-slash-techno-dance edge. The record was a success, but according to David, it was a terrible album. Perhaps this is what prompted him in 1988 to make an unexpected turn and abruptly put the career of a solo star on the shelf, forming his new band, Tin Machine. Having become a relatively anonymous member of the band for the first time since the 1970s, Bowie was sure that this time he would be able to assemble a strong team, which at the same time would not be a superstar project. Having invited sales brothers Hunt and Tony, familiar to him from the days of playing with Iggy Pop in the 70s, as well as guitar innovator Reeves Gabriels, Bowie made up the band. Democracy was supposed to be in Tin Machine, but still David hogged the blanket both in songwriting and in decision making. The band's debut album was called Tin Machine. As they say, don't break what already works. The album was quite successful, although not everyone liked the politicization of the lyrics. But in them, Bowie condemned drugs, fascism, and television. Tin Machine proved their resilience as a modern alternative concert band with a simplified guitar-oriented sound and new material. The guy's first world tour was a commercial success, but there was a growing dissatisfaction among fans and critics to perceive Bowie's performance as a simple band member. A series of Tin Machine singles failed the chart, and Bowie left the label after a disagreement. Unexpectedly, Bowie himself, like his audience and critics, became increasingly disappointed that he was just one of the band members. Tin Machine began working on the second album, but Bowie suspended the undertaking and returned to solo work. He went on a tour in which he once again felt recognition and returned to his success. On the wave of returning fame in one interview, he was asked, As an idol, people look up to you. I think I'm seen as an idol. I think I'm seen as a, a more than competent songwriter who's a, a good performer. Over the next decade, David immersed himself in everything from hard rock inspired by Nine Inch Nails and Placebo to drum and bass and Eurodance inspired by Prodigy. At the same time, he painted and sold his paintings at auctions. In October 1990, ten years after his divorce from Angie, Bowie met Somali-born supermodel Iman. It happened in Los Angeles on a blind date thanks to their mutual acquaintance. The next day, the performer invited the girl to tea, and Iman found out that he did not drink tea. They went to the nearest coffee shop. In an interview years later, the girl recalled she was not ready for a relationship. For him, it was overwhelming. I was not ready for a relationship. Definitely, I didn't want to get into a relationship with somebody like him. But as I always said, I fell in love with David Jones. I did not fall in love with David Bowie. Bowie is just a persona. He's a singer, an entertainer. David Jones is a man I met. The girl did not refuse the musician, but only asked not to rush things and first get to know each other's families. On April 20th, 1992, Bowie appeared at the Freddie Mercury tribute concert, which took place on the anniversary of the death of the Queen vocalist. During it, David knelt down and said the Lord's Prayer at Wembley Stadium. Four days later, he took Amon with him to the Adriatic Sea and proposed in the Bosphorus Strait on his yacht. Newly married couple Amon and David got married in a private ceremony in Lausanne, Switzerland. The solemn celebration of the wedding took place on June 6 at a villa in Florence, Italy. When the couple was looking for a new home to live in, they first arrived in Los Angeles. However, at this time, the 1992 Los Angeles riots broke out, which is why the lovers were imprisoned in the hotel and watched what was happening from the inside. Amon and I arrived in Los Angeles from Italy on the day the Rodney King verdict was announced and the riots started. 
There was a very numbing experience, a sense of true revolution. It did seem to have the feel of nothing less than some kind of prison riot. People who had been treated inhumanely, not given a chance to secure any foot on any ladder, and all the social moors were suddenly abandoned. Then it was decided to look for housing in New York. The new marriage had the greatest impact on the performer at that time. Meanwhile, the album Tin Machine 2 was released, but neither critics nor listeners cared about it anymore. It was the band's last album. 1993 brought the long-awaited return of David Bowie as a solo artist, with Black Tie White Noise. Taking the first place in the UK album charts, the record assured fans that Bowie's creative curiosity was insatiable as never before. The album was influenced by soul, jazz, and hip-hop, and it increasingly moved towards alternative rock. The following year, Bowie reunited with Brian Eno, with whom they created the Berlin Trilogy, and now they were working in the studio again. The result was the concept album Outside, released in 1995. The cover of the record was one of five self-portraits of David, written by him in the same year. The comprehensive project explored the increasing obsession with the mutation of the human body as art and the paganization of Western society. With lyrics taken from the diary of the fictional character Nathan Adler, Ghostly Sounds, a soundtrack to a non-linear storyline of art, murder, and technology, Outside anticipated a new, darker sensibility that would soon be inherent not only in music, but also in cinema, literature, and art in general. So the first single from the album, The Heart's Filthy Lesson, appeared in the soundtrack to one of the darkest films of the year that became mainstream, Seven by David Fincher. In the summer of 1996, Bowie played in Julian Schnabel's biopic, Basquiat, and his partners on the site were Gary Oldman, Christopher Walken, Dennis Hopper, Willem Dafoe, Courtney Love, and Benicio Del Toro. David played the character immortalized in his 1972 song, Andy Warhol. The film tells a fictional story about Basquiat's life. A struggling artist living in a cardboard box in Tompkins Square Park makes his way up the steps of the New York art world in the 80s, thanks in part to his connections with Andy Warhol. For the film, David was able to wear a real wig, glasses, and a Warhol jacket from the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. The image was successful. Paul Morrissey, who had worked on many Warhol films, compared the new picture with the previous ones, and said, Bowie was the best by far. You come away from Basquiat thinking Andy was comical and amusing, not a pretentious phony piece of shit, which is how others show him. Bowie at least knew Andy. They went to the same parties. On February 12, 1997, David Bowie received his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. The end of the 90s turned out to be quite fruitful for the performer. Albums, singles, a charity song for BBC Children in Need, tours, a concert in honor of their own 50th anniversary, and even soundtracks for movies and computer games. The website BowieNet was also launched in 1998, www.davidbowie.com, the world's first internet service provider created by an artist, and a nominee for the Wired Award in 1999 as the best entertainment site of the year. In fact, it was Bowie's famous fan site giving access to exclusive materials including new music, images, videos, a kind of magazine, forums, and even access to the person himself. And, well, yes, access to the internet itself was also built in. All this entertainment costs $19.95 per month. In 1999, David somehow found time to play the lead role in the film Mr. Rice's Secret, and then joined the prestigious list, including B.B. King, Dizzy Gillespie, and Quincy Jones to receive the title of Honorary Doctor of Music from Boston's Berklee College of Music and received the Légion d'Honneur Award in France. In July of the same year, David was recognized as the biggest music star of the 20th century by Readers of the Sun. At the turn of the century, David enjoyed a period when he was out of the public eye, appearing only because of a few rare and significant live performances. For a couple of years, he supported Tibbet House charity concerts at New York's Carnegie Hall to help the campaign for a free Tibbet. Life changed shortly after the birth of David and Amon's first child. On August 15, 2000, the couple had a daughter, Alexandria Zara Jones, at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. The girl was affectionately called Lexi. By the way, Amon also took custody of Bowie's son from his first marriage. Duncan Jones. Bowie took advantage of this time to enjoy fatherhood, but also did not forget to write new music for the new album, so the family mostly lived in Manhattan and London. In addition to music, Bowie tried several forms of writing during his life. In the late 1990s, Bowie wrote articles in various media, including an essay on Jean-Michel Bisquite for the 2001 anthology book, Writers on Artists. 
and four words to Joe Levin's publication, GQ Cool. Mick Rock's photography portfolio, Blood and Glitter, his wife Amon's book, I Am Amon, and also wrote annotations to several albums of artists and much more. In fact, in the 90s, Bowie could do whatever he wanted, and this pushing of boundaries isolated some fans who were used to the old sound of Bowie's music. The artist's 23rd album, Heathen, released in 2002, again received critical and fan acclaim. They admired his mature return to the Berlin era, while retaining a sense of novelty. On the album, Bowie played more instruments than ever, including drums, almost all synthesizer work, and a little piano. A year later, the album Reality was released and David went on the accompanying world tour, A Reality Tour. Suddenly, quite unexpectedly during a performance at the Hurricane Festival in Schievel on June 25th, he felt a pain in his chest. Initially, it was assumed that it was a pinched nerve in the shoulder, but later, the pain was diagnosed as an acute blockage of the coronary artery, requiring emergency angioplasty in Hamburg. In simple words, Bowie had a heart attack. Of course, the remaining 14 concerts of the tour had to be cancelled. From then until 2013, the singer seemed to have almost completely disappeared and behaved extremely restrained, but he could still put his stamp of approval on artists performing with Arcade Fire and Pink Floyd legend Dave Glimmer. In 2006, Bowie also received a Lifetime Achievement Grammy and briefly returned to acting with the blockbuster film directed by Christopher Nolan, The Prestige. Our bodies, Mr. Angier, are quite capable of conducting and indeed producing energy. And later, he played himself in one of the episodes of Extras, Ricky Gervais's series on HBO. In 2012, a plaque was unveiled on Hedden Street, London, where the cover for Siggy Stardust was shot to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the release of the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Only in 2013, on his 66th birthday, David Bowie suddenly and quietly released a new single called Where Are We Now and announced the release of a new album called The Next Day. It was especially phenomenal that despite the complete absence of traditional advertising, not a single interview or live performance, Bowie's 25th studio album and the first in 10 years took second place in the US charts and first in the UK and 18 other countries. In August 2015, it was announced that Bowie was writing songs for a Broadway musical based on the animated series SpongeBob SquarePants. He also continued to write soundtracks for television series, and in December, his musical Lazarus debuted in New York. It may seem that David took up work with renewed vigor, but in fact the climax had long been left behind. It was a very difficult period of time, perhaps we can say the final one. In January of the following year, on his 69th birthday, the studio album Black Star was released. No one knew then that it was the last. The artist's influence was still relevant. It turned out that David listened to Kendrick Lamar a lot and was still not afraid to push the boundaries. Yes, he stopped creating new personalities a long time ago, but his sound did not stop developing. The record was released on January 8th, and after two days, he was gone. David Bowie died on January 10th at Lafayette Street, home in New York City. Everything indicates that the artist planned to make the album his swan song and a farewell gift for fans before his death. Several journalists and critics subsequently noted that most of the lyrics on the album seemed to revolve around his impending death. He couldn't leave on a higher note, as the last album received fantastic reviews. Bowie hid his illness, and friends and fans were surprised by his death. David had been battling cancer for 18 months but probably none of his colleagues and friends on stage knew about it, except Tony Visconti, who produced his albums. He texted, His death was no different from his life, a work of art. He made Black Star for us, his parting gift. I knew for a year this was the way it would be. I wasn't, however, prepared for it. He was an extraordinary man, full of love and life. He will always be with us. For now... It is appropriate to cry. In an interview, Visconti said Bowie was completely bald after chemotherapy when they talked. According to him, David had prepared five more demo songs and planned for a post-Black Star album. Obviously, he assumed that he had a few more months left. By mid-2015, when Black Star's studio recordings were completed, there was hope that the disease was in remission, but by November, the cancer had spread throughout the body. The doctors said his condition was incurable. A few hours after his death, 
commemorative memorials began to appear around the world. In Brixton, the area of London where Bowie was born, a mural painted in 2013 by Australian artist Jimmy C. became a shrine. Fans left flowers, records, and handwritten messages under it. In Berlin, fans left flowers outside the apartment where David Bowie and Iggy Pop lived while Bowie was creating his seminal Berlin trilogy. Flowers were also left outside Bowie's apartment in New York and next to his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In Milan, fans held a memorial flash mob service at Colón di San Lorenzo, and fans in Rio de Janeiro paid tribute to Bowie at the February Carnival in Rio. Millions of fans around the world mourned the passing of the legend. When David Bowie died, his wife Amon wrote in memory of him, The struggle is real, but so is God. Many have spoken out or performed in memory of the legendary artists they were familiar with. Some more and some less. Mick Jagger, Iggy Pop, Madonna, Queen, The Who, Elton John, Paul McCartney, Kate Bush, Dave Gahan at Depeche Mode, and Yoko Ono, who noted Bowie's friendship with herself and John Lennon and thanked him for being a father figure to her son Sean following Lennon's death. Brian Eno remembers how he had been communicating with David Bowie by email for the last few years, living in London when he lived in New York. They signed the letters with fictitious names. Some of David's were Mr. Showbiz, Milton Keynes, Rhoda Borax, and the Duke of Ear. For Brian, the death of a friend also came as a terrible surprise. They've known each other for over 40 years, in a friendship that was always tinged by echoes of comic characters Pete and Dud. I feel a huge gap now, Brian said. I received an email from him seven days ago. It was as funny as always, and as surreal, looping through word games and illusions and all the usual stuff we did. It ended with this sentence. Thank you for our good times, Brian. They will never rot. And it was signed, Dawn. I realize now he was saying goodbye. At the 59th Annual Grammy Awards in 2017, David Bowie won in all five categories. Best Rock Performance, Best Alternative Music Album, Best Engineered Album, Non-Classical, Best Recording Package, and Best Rock Song. These were the first Grammy statuettes for David in the music categories. It's a pity that he got them posthumously. In the winter of 2019, a biographical film Stardust with musician and actor Johnny Flynn as Bowie was announced. The film tells the story of Bowie during his first trip to the United States in 1971. The script of the film was written by Christopher Bell and directed by Gabriel Range. Bowie's son, director Duncan Jones, opposed the film saying he had not been consulted and that the film would not have permission to use Bowie's music. The film was released a year later, received unfavorable reviews, and completely failed at the box office. On May 23, 2022, the release of another film based on Bowie's musical journey throughout his career was announced. The film titled Munage Daydream, in honor of the song of the same name, was written and directed by Brett Morgan, featuring never-before-seen footage, performances, and music, and led by Bowie's own narration. Bowie cannot be defined. He can be experienced. That is why we crafted Munage Daydream to be a unique cinematic experience. The documentary is the first posthumous film about Bowie approved by his family. It premiered at the 2022 Cannes Film Festival. This is to major David Bowie has lived a bright and eventful life. He never stopped working and developing whether it was music or any other kind of art. He created images with talent, destroying stereotypes, and overcame any barriers. Bowie has released a colossal discography of inimitable music, more albums than some artists combined. Unfortunately, cancer takes the best. But David Bowie will forever remain a legend for millions of people around the world. And we will always remember not only his music, but also his film works. Even his episodic roles like Tesla and Prestige are worthy of praise. Do you want to know more about this movie? Click on the link to the video and find out what the secret of Tesla's phenomenal car and other details of Christopher Nolan's intricate masterpiece are. Thank you for watching this video to the end. You can subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet, so we will understand that we are not working and improving from video to video for nothing. Exactly the way the incredible Bowie did it. It was Biographer. See you soon.